Okay, so we're now recording for the research and application uh, webinar series from UNCG Libraries on non-traditional spaces at Jackson Library by Rachel Olson. Thanks, Rachel. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today or viewing this webinar in the future. Um, so I'm going to be talking about non-traditional spaces at Jackson Library, and I'll explain what I mean by that. And we'll also give a disclaimer, um, but just a couple things first. If you would like to access these slides, you can do so at go.uncg.edu slash RRTTP7. Um, and it's, it's not a terribly long slideshow, but there are some links in here that you may find helpful or students may find helpful. Um, so definitely feel free to take advantage of that. And I do want to give a disclaimer that I... Uh, I had I played a part in developing a couple of these spaces and definitely and still play a part in maintaining them and running them. But a lot of the work that's going to be talked about in this presentation is not mine and it's it represents the efforts of colleagues around the library. Um, and I, so I really want to give them credit and make sure that you know I'm not I'm not taking credit for what other folks have done and I'll try to point that out and be clear about who the contact people are. Um, if you have questions or want to learn more about a particular thing. So um, I'm Rachel Olson. I'm the social sciences librarian here at UNCG, and this is my email address. You can definitely feel free to contact me if you have questions. Um, I don't have a slide for what I mean by non-traditional library spaces and probably should have put one in. But anyway, I'll just sort of think out loud here. To me, when we think about libraries, um, we tend to think about books, right? And we tend to think about, a lot of people tend to think about people shushing them um, or, you know, just this quiet sort of sometimes stale environment. Um, and a lot of us really love those quiet spaces and that, that ideal of libraries that we have in our mind for sure. So I'm not knocking it, um, but Jackson Library is changing. Um, and it has some cool spaces now that I think can serve patrons who have unique needs or unique things that they're after um, without disturbing people who would like to use libraries for more traditional purposes. So I don't want those two ideas to seem like they're in conflict with each other um, because there's room for everybody. So anyway, so I'm going to talk about uh, a couple different things and can definitely throw in some um, some other fun facts about things that we offer at Jackson Library if people are interested. So I'm gonna talk about the family study room, the lending cupboard, the lactation room, our group study spaces, and then a little bit about the digital media commons. Um, and there was something that I was gonna say and I can't remember now, but anyway, maybe it'll come back to me. Oh, um, I am not talking about the Schiffman Music Library in this presentation or the Teaching Resource Center, but they're both really awesome spaces. They are both, uh, I think, non-traditional in a lot of their own ways. So you should definitely check them out and I'm happy to give anybody uh, contact information or links for those if that's of interest. So the first one is the Family Study Room. We actually started this space back in 2019. We It was a different time, uh, and we actually, a group of folks, including myself and quite a few people from around the library, went down to UNC Charlotte. Um, they have what they call, a, I think, a family study room as well. It is essentially a space for people who are accompanied by children. So you, you bring a kid to the library, um, and I think in a lot of times there are, you know, uh, you'll get dirty looks from other people studying if you make noise or, you know, the, the kid will just be sitting there bored, nothing to do. So we created this space to kind of give them um, somewhere to be, somewhere that's safe and secure and, and, and you know, secluded. There's a door that closes so, so people can... Um, you know, be closed off. It's on a group study floor. We'll talk more about what that means, but I'm going to show you the library guide for this space. I don't actually have any good pictures of the room, um, but anyway, it is uh, room 363 of the of the library's tower. Um, I'm really proud of it. I think it it is really helpful to the people who do use it. Um, it tends to be more popular among faculty and graduate students, but it is open to all UNCG students, staff, and faculty. Um, so anybody watching this recording, wondering if it's for you, definitely feel free to check it out. Um, and the way it works is people fill out a quick registration form, which just <laughs> explains some policies, gives us some basic information. Um, we The library does have an underage children policy, which basically says 
children have to be accompanied at all times. We've got a couple policies related to the family study room. So you fill this out and then you can actually make a reservation uh, as well using this form. It's just run through a, a LibCal software. Anyway, uh, you can make a reservation for up to three hours per day. Um, you also can just show up and ask to use the room. And if nobody is, is currently using it, we have a shared calendar. Um, you're definitely welcome to come. And all you need is a UNCG ID. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I really like this guide because I did some research and put in a lot of links to North Carolina resources, as well as sort of local uh, UNCG specific resources, things about, you know, Title IX protections for pregnant or parenting students, things about Spartan Open Pantry, some health and human services related information. There's also this page on knowing your rights. The National Women's Law Center has put together kind of this neat toolkit, which gives people information about uh, what particular rights and protections you have if you are a parent in college or if you are a pregnant person in college. So anyway, um, there's that. And again, I'm happy to answer questions about the family room. Um, we can always come back to it. But if people are interested, um, there's the link for more information. So the lending cupboard is a, a new space in Jackson Library. And, and so I'll give you some background. We just did a presentation on this, so I borrowed some slides. Um, basically, it is, if you've heard of a library of things, um, it's similar, but not exactly the same because we're, we're a lot more focused on a particular population of students and we're a lot more focused on a particular function. Um, so essentially what happened was last August, a student who was taking a graduate student tour filled out our form to sign up for the tour and said, do you have a lending cover? And I didn't know what that was. So I reached out and asked the student, you know, can you explain a little bit more? Essentially it's a space where people can go and borrow household items from libraries. Um, and it does, uh, the examples that we've seen are specifically focused on international students, um, because if you think about it, you know, people coming from different countries, you're probably not going to pack up your pots and pans and bring them with you. And so you would have to buy those things when you get to where you're going. Um, so we wanted to save those students some money, did some brainstorming with a couple colleagues um, in my department, and we ended up applying for and receiving a State Library of North Carolina Bright Ideas Grant. I think they do these grants every year. Um, and it's funded by LSTA, which stands for, don't ask me. I can't remember what LSTA stands for right now. But anyway, it's a neat program um, and they provide funds to libraries around the state. We applied and were able to get one. Um, and we did some outreach. We work with the International Program Center to help uh, make international students aware that this space exists for them um, so that they can take advantage of it. Uh, we also, yeah, we're going to be doing some programming coming up. There's something called Cram and Scram, um, where students donate items basically that they don't want to take home with them. So we may be able to get some things for the space from there. But basically, uh, international students can borrow household items. And we have some really neat stuff, as I'll show you <laughs> here. Um, and this is our LibGuide for the Lending Cupboard. And you've got information about the grant. You also have these different tabs, which show what we have available and how many. This is slightly outdated because we got some extra money to be able to buy some more stuff. So I'm going to be adding to it. Um, but we try to be really specific about what we have. Um, we try to link to product information whenever possible so people can see you know, is this microwave dishwasher safe? Is it BPA free? Or if they want to buy their own, something like that. Um, we try to provide that information. So we've got all kinds of really neat stuff in there and it's been really popular. Um, we've learned a lot and have a lot of, you know, changes planned. Um, someday we'll hopefully expand into a larger space. Right now we're just in sort of a closet, um, <clears throat> but it's it's worked really well and, and served our needs for sure so far. So it's a neat space and I'm excited to see where it goes in the future. And one thing I like about this guy that's kind of cool, you can, if you click check availability, students can actually look at what's currently checked out and what's currently available so that if they're trying to decide whether or not they want to come across campus to take a look at something um, or to borrow something, they can see if it's, if it's there. And we do have a wish list for anyone watching this recording later. You can click our Amazon wish list. 
uh, if you're interested in donating. The family room also has an Amazon wish list linked. Um, it is here. Donations welcome. So if you're uh, interested in donating to either one, we always welcome that. So that's the lending cupboard. So the lactation room is a space that I was not involved in developing, but I like to promote with the family room because I think that it goes hand in hand. Um, so it is for library users who are either breast or chest feeding. Um, it is located in the tower of Jackson Library and the users can check out a key from the circulation desk. I think it's kind of neat because there's, um, if you look at the more information tab, they actually have a pump in the room and, and, and people who are um, wanting to use the space can bring their own kit that works with this pump um, and actually use it there. They don't have to carry around their own pump if they don't want to. Um, and they are really careful about, you know, the information here talks about safety and sanitation. Um, that's really important. And this space is open to anyone who visits the library. I'll say for now, the lending cupboard is only for international students specifically. And the family room is open to any UNCG user, but not necessarily the wider community, although we make exceptions on a case by case basis. But this lactation space, one thing I think that's really important is that it is open to anyone who comes into the library. So um, again, I'm not involved in this, but I think it's a really awesome space to have. And I definitely applaud the people who worked hard to get this into place. The next space I'm going to talk about just quickly for people who may not know, um, we have areas in Jackson Library that are specifically designated for quiet study. So floor six, seven, eight, and nine of the library tower are uh, specifically for people who need some peace and quiet to get studying done. And we do enforce, <coughs> excuse me, we do enforce the um, quiet on those floors. All the other areas in Jackson Library allow group work and talking. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because when we talk about reserving study rooms, um, that may be a consideration that some people want to make. Uh, if you want to meet up with a group, but you need a space that has particular equipment in it, or if you want to um, study in a room of your own, but you want a, you know, you want it to be on a quiet floor or something like that, that's available. So if you use this link, which is just uncg.libcal.com, you can actually see what's available here. Um, they have small, medium, and large rooms. So let's say I wanted to meet up with a group of four. Um, and you can see here, let's try the medium. And you can see, I really like this. They have pictures of what the space looks like. It tells you it's not fully enclosed, has this display, HDMI cord, whiteboard walls, power outlet. They've really done a good job of making it clear what you can expect when you use this space. And as you can see, they're pretty popular. Um, and if you look around finals time, uh, they're even more popular. And so you can reserve for, I think, up to, I'm going to get it wrong, up to two hours a day, um, although I could double check that. And so you can just reserve by clicking the block on the time slot that you want. And when you're ready, um, you can submit your times and it'll ask you for just some basic information. It also does say whether or not the space is accessible, wheelchair accessible there. So I think that's helpful. Um, our larger spaces, uh, if you wanted to do like a seminar or something, um, you could certainly reserve one of these spaces. There aren't as many of them. And then the smaller library spaces, I mean, the smaller um, study spaces, you can do it based on whether or not you need a computer in the room, things like that. And you can also see some of the um, <coughs> other categories, things that are in the digital media commons, which we're going to talk about. Um, so you can reserve some of those things here. So I think, you know, reservable study spaces aren't new in libraries, but I think that it's an important feature. A lot of people, um, a lot of graduate students especially, come for tours of the library and they've been told by professors that we have spaces that they can reserve all semester for themselves. That's no longer true. Um, and so we have to dispel that myth and then also show them how to reserve study space on a, need, on a, a, a as needed basis using this link. So that's something that comes up a lot. So if you're an instructor watching this, uh, we don't do semester long reservations anymore, but feel free to share this link with your students. And then the last space that I want to mention is the digital media commons. So they're 
um, specific focus is on helping people with digital projects and multimedia projects. And so if an instructor wants students to say, make a podcast for a class or create a website or something like that, um, I know I would feel really like confused and, and not really be sure where to go uh, if I was asked to make a podcast. So that's what the DMC uh, is for. They have the equipment, they have the technology that people can use. Um, their LibGuide is very thorough. Um, their website here, uh, they talk about what they do. If you're interested in bringing your class uh, or bringing a group for a tour, you can fill out a form here. They do offer walk-in hours. Um, they're definitely, you know, they've got, you can see some examples of work that they've helped with before here. Um, they have a lot of information on this library guide. One thing that I think is interesting that I use all the time is poster printing. So if you need something printed, uh, I make posters a lot for library displays and things like that. They're actually able to do that. And it's a pretty low cost for that sort of printing. So if you have something coming up, uh, like a, a conference and you need to make a poster for it, the DMC can definitely help you out with that. Um, there are size limitations, so pay attention to that. Looks like they can also do book printing, so that's cool. Um, they have workshops and events that go on every once in a while. This is from last semester. Um, they did quite a few things on, you know, video, audio editing, Photoshop, things like that. And they have this calendar. You can also see um, they have things about, I was looking at this page this morning, for people who are working on digital projects and need to consider things like copyright um, and fair use. They have information on that. And then they also have these spaces that I wanted to talk about. So they have a maker lab that has lots of, these are 3D printers that you can see here. Um, and you can reserve some of that equipment and get some help with using it. Um, it is, it does have a small cost, but it's not anything particularly prohibitive. So they've got lots of good information here. Um, another space is the gaming lab tends to be kind of popular. You can see the different games that they have available here. Um, the VR lab, I've used some of the VR equipment before. It's pretty neat. Um, and you can do, you know, they have fun games and stuff like that, but they also have things that are more educational. This uh, fine art museum is one, a lot of art stuff related to this. Um, they also have things like Google VR has some software. Um, so I think it's kind of neat. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about with them is their green screen room. Um, they do have areas if you want to do podcasting or recording of any kind, um, they have those spaces available. So for any students who are watching this, don't feel like when you get assigned a digital project, like you have to run out and buy equipment or buy software because they definitely have people who can help you um, with all the different sort of things involved there. So one question that I'm anticipating some people may have is what about the library's renovation? How will that impact these spaces? Um, the best answer I can give is that I don't really know. I think that all of these spaces will continue to exist in some form uh, after the renovation is complete. I've specifically seen um, initial ideas that do include space for the family room and the DMC. Um, I'm sure that group study rooms would continue to be, uh, you know, a feature because they're really popular. Students really enjoy using those. Um, so it's difficult to say right now, but I don't think there's any reason not to be optimistic about these particular spaces um, and, and their continued existence after the renovation's over. So... That's all I have formally to share with you. I'm definitely happy to take any questions if people have those. Sorry, something fell on my desk. Anna. Thanks for this presentation, Rachel. And uh, thanks for sharing that you expect these spaces to continue. One thing that I wondered about as I listened was about um, if if y'all are tracking like usage of these rooms to be able to advocate and show um, show the impact that of these spaces in the future. Yeah. So with the you know thinking about the linden cupboard, we have 
and check out data specifically about you know what's been borrowed um so we definitely have that um the circulation desk the access services department i feel sure probably keeps tabs on how many people are using the lactation room um the dmc has their own stats keeping and then for the family study room we have a, a calendar that shows reservations and then also whenever someone uses it we have a specific way that we log it into our stats so i need to pull those if you're interested to see um, how many uses we've had. Um, so the short answer is we, we do keep track of stats. Yeah. So um, we're always looking for more people to use these spaces because it does help us sort of justify room in the new building. Um, yeah. Good question. And then the group study spaces, I know there's definitely a lot of, of stats tracking they do. Sorry, Juanita, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say it was a really good presentation. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the space or well, the new building, how it will uh, maybe hopefully enhance the use of those spaces um, and probably bear out the need for, for some other, you know, kind of traditional or non traditional type spaces. Um, yeah. And, you know, my hope is that the designers will continue to have conversations with people who run these spaces about why they're important. I think that there's some initial survey data that was collected that doesn't quite capture everything, you know, our, our non-traditional students and their needs. We could do a whole webinar on non-traditional students um, and and sort of specific library needs that those populations have. So yeah. I agree. Um, I was actually telling someone the other day about how um, when we closed the building on the weekends, a lot of the, you know, uh, either international students or not traditional age students were uh, dismayed because there were no there was nowhere where they could get computer access after seven. You know when we closed on Saturdays at seven. Um, right. So we would let them stay in the connector space because it stayed open later than the library and the EUC, and they could get Wi-Fi there. You know. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we could do a whole we could do a whole thing on that. That's not a bad idea. Talk about, you know, the importance of providing access to this stuff. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Sure. I have one more question, Rachel, and this is something that I kind of struggle with as well, or maybe maybe y'all don't struggle with this, but getting the word out about services and spaces, like how do y'all connect to people to let them know that these exist? Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. I mean, we're really lucky to, with the lending covered, to have connections with the International Program Center because it's a direct um, you know, direct contact with students that they work with who are the exact population that we're hoping to, um, you know, promote it with. I think the family study room is more of a challenge because it's, I would say that, like I mentioned earlier, it tends to be more graduate students and faculty mentioning um, using it, but there absolutely are undergraduate students who use it. It's hard to know. Um, I don't think the university has a lot of information on pregnant and parenting students. And if they do, um, they can't share a lot of that. So we kind of have to guess as to where those things are happening. But yeah, I um, would love to promote them more, maybe talk to the Graduate Student Association, see if they have ideas for, for promoting it. So I, I definitely struggle with getting the word out. I think it's always a challenge, but it sounds like y'all are doing some great stuff. So awesome, thank you. Yeah, I know that when I told the public health department about a lot of these rooms, Rachel, they were like super excited. So, yeah, we should. I mean, we definitely need to continue pushing and promoting. We should probably do like a flyer on non traditional library spaces that just kind of includes a little bit of everything um, so that people can share and, and pass that around. Social media is one way when the family room reopened because it was closed for a couple of years because of COVID. Um, so when we reopened, um, we definitely relied on social media to help get word out. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for this great presentation. Um, I dropped the links to the next one in the chat as well as the assessment form. Um, and they will all be links in the email that I'll send out with the recording. I can do it today, I'm pretty confident. Um, so the next one coming up just for the sake of the recording is bringing primary sources into the classroom, special collections and university archives with Stacey Krim and Kathleen Smith. Um, so Juanita and Anna sign up and I'll put it in the email as well so other people can sign up and I'll send out all the stuff. 
the week before. So uh, happy Monday, everyone. I feel like it's a very Monday, Monday. Definitely. I got back from Pittsburgh yesterday, so I sleepy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thanks y'all for coming. Thanks everyone. And see y'all soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.